Hey, it's Jim from Vowels and More, an online vintage tube store. And today in Tube Lab number 20, part A, we're going to learn how to read a power supply schematic using my 6 or 12 SN7 preamp as an example. But first caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. And if you're enjoying these videos, please hit the like button and subscribe. In tube lab number 19, we took a first look at my prototype dual mono 6 or 12 SN7 line preamp. This week we're going to go over the schematic in detail. Now this is designed as a 101 class, so if you're an old hand, just skip to the last part of the video when I unbox some amazing direct heated triodes. And the schematic is now available as a free download. Just go to the store, home page, top right, under information, downloads, and I'll put a link below as well. And of course there's always a link below for the store. I've broken the video into two parts. This, part A, will look at the preamp power supply, and part B will look at the preamp circuit itself. Let's jump in and I'll show you how easy it is to read one of these things. Okay, everything starts at the wall plug. We have a hot, ground, and neutral. I'll we'll start with the ground. It comes over here, it hops over, which means it doesn't connect. Today, often, you'll see a straight line through with no dot. No dot means no connection as well. A dot here means it's connected. It comes all the way along here and it goes to this symbol, which is your ground symbol or earth. And you want to bolt that to the chassis. Next, we've got our neutral. It comes along through here, through a switch, and onto the first leg of the transformer. Next, we've got our hot leg. It comes through to a DPST switch. What's that? Do we have two switches here? Well, in a way we do, but they're all in the same package. This is a double pull, single throw switch. And I've got one right here. Let me just go get it. Okay. So this is what I actually used in the build. That's a standard IEC in. That's the fuse block. There's the lit switch. You flip it over. This is our ground connection here. This is our neutral. This is our hot coming in. Comes down to here, goes through the fuse block, and ends up over here. This is our actual switch. So what you do is you jumper the hot leg over, you jumper the neutral over, and here are two poles. There's one pole, there's two poles, and of course you throw across, that's a single throw. So when you, and the other side of course connects up to the transformer. So when you throw the switch, you actually connect the neutral and the hot at the same time. And when you disconnect it, the only thing left connected is the ground of the chassis. Neat, huh? Okay. Next, we've got the primary fuse, a slow blow, 500 milliamps, or 0.5 amps, or half an amp. Slow blow could be marked SB. If it was fast blow, it might be marked FB. And you want slow blow because we've got some some surge on startup. And we want the fuse to have some time to absorb all that energy without popping. Now, we might have been able to use a little smaller value than 500 milliamps. But the next size down is 100 milliamps, and that's too small. So 500 milliamps will work just fine in this, in this spot. And <clears throat> the hot leg now connects to the other leg of our power transformer. And our power transformer is a universal R core. And it takes a nominal on the primary side, it takes a nominal 115 or nominal 230 volts. So it can take anything from 110 to 120 volts AC or 220 to 240 volts AC. All that's going to happen is if your voltage is a little lower, your B plus is going to be a little bit lower, and if your voltage is a little higher over here, your B plus is going to be a little higher, and you'll deal that with that at the dropping resistor, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Now, if you're on 230 volts AC, 
you get the same wires as 115 volts, just wired in a different configuration, and I've actually drawn it out for you. Now, here these look like they might be turns, and that's in fact what they are. A copper wire wrapped around, and here we've got what looks like two iron bars, and that signifies the iron core of the transformer. And how these transformers work is there's no direct electrical connection across. When you put voltage on the primary turns, or the primary side, you induce a voltage on the other side. And depending on the number of turns that you've got here on this side, will determine the voltage on this side. Neat, huh? Okay, next we, we jump into a pair of 100 milliamp fuses. And that protects this side of the transformer. If we were to take a voltmeter and put our negative and positive across these two, we would get approximately 220 volts AC. Now, this transformer is a 0 0220-34 milliamp secondary, and it's a 0 0220-34 milliamp. Again, what the heck is that? Well, it's actually two transformers inside one envelope, which makes for a convenient small package. And of course we want a dual mono preamp, so we need a, a, we need a dual power supply. So it works perfectly for our purposes. So here we go. We've got one of these legs comes up to the bridge, another one comes over here. If we were to measure these to ground, we got 110 volts AC, makes perfect sense. Now because there's no center tap on this transformer, we need a full bridge. And you see these orientations of the diodes, they're all facing forward. We're using UF4007. UF just stands for ultra fast, so that means that diodes switch very quickly and hopefully that reduces our noise. Now, you might have noticed that there's another side down here. So this is one complete su power supply for one channel. In this case I've just marked it as the right channel. It could be the A channel, it could be the left, doesn't matter, same thing. On our, the other side of our dual power supply it's an identical circuit, exactly the same. So we only need to draw one side of it. Oh, and I've got a prototype full bridge. It's on a proto board. There's your two fuses. There's the first filter cap. Let me get it up nice and close so you can see. See the four diodes arranged in the bridge? And you can just see the little slash at the, the front. It's a little, a little white band. That's your forward leg. Let's just get this out of the road. There we go. This is your dropping resistor and there's your bleeder. And we'll see those in a minute. Okay. So off of this leg, we go straight to ground. And off the forward leg of the bridge, we have positive. We have an approximately 282 volts DC. And that's raw DC. Now we need to smooth that out because we want our B plus nice and clean for our audio circuit. And we do that with a bunch of filters. So the first filter is a 33 microfarad, 450 volt electrolytic capacitor. Now, electrolytics have to be oriented properly, so the plus side goes to the B plus rail, the positive rail, the negative side goes to ground. Next, we've got a DC choke or a DC filter. That's how they're shown. I've got one right here that I used in the build. This is a 15 Henry, 30 milliamp, DC, 400 volt. And all this is, is a coil of coated copper wire around a core. One wire in, one wire out. It creates a little bit of resistance. And as a result of the winding, it cleans up the DC nicely. Now, one Henry would be very small. 10 Henrys is a nice value for a choke. And for a very quiet preamp, 
15 Henrys is just lovely. Now you might have noticed that the choke is only rated for 30 milliamps and yet our transformer is rated for 34. That sounds like it might be a little low. Well in fact even with the startup surge of the circuit it doesn't come anywhere near 30 milliamps and in fact this is just a small preamp. It, when it's operating it only it only draws a few a handful of milliamps. So this is perfectly fine. You wouldn't want to go much lower than that. You also will see a resistance rating on a choke. In this case it's 1026 ohms and that will reduce our B plus or raw B plus a little bit. That's actually 1.026 K. So that's a fair size amount of resistance but the larger the value of your Henry's the higher the resistance because you have more wire and if you have a higher voltage choke you're going to have higher gauge wire so you're going to have even more resistance. This is acceptable. 1K is perfect. You'll see in a minute how much we needed to drop the, the B+. Next we've got another filtering cap, a larger 330 microfarad, 450 volts. You might have noticed that the voltage is quite higher than what our raw B plus is. And what you want is some room. So when the surge happens, we get a lot of current, we get a lot of voltage all in one quick shot through the, through the amp. So we want this to be roughly 1.5 times what our B plus is. And that's pretty close, but bang on. Anywhere close is fine. Now these are much larger. This is 10 times the size of the first cap. Let's take a look at it. So you're going to get the, the manufacturer. Nishikon makes a very high quality cap. You're going to get the uh, specification which matches the data sheet, the temperature rating, the values. And you're going to get this band that looks like it's got some negative symbols on it. That's your negative band. So off the negative band, that's your negative connection right there. And of course, that makes that the positive. You don't want to get these things in backwards, that's for sure. Now, you might have noticed the size difference. You want a smaller cap on the at the first position because when this first turns on, there's a lot of inrush current. You don't want to have a huge capacitor here creating a large draw. You want it further down after the after the choke. Okay, next we've got the dropping resistor. In this case, it's a 2K2 3 watt metal oxide. I like metal oxides. They, they're, they're good resistors to use in power supplies. They can handle the surge and the heat requirements of a power supply. Now, what the heck is 2K2? Well, that actually is 2.2K. That's just how we write it so we don't lose the decimal place in the transcription or the photocopying. So 2K2 is actually 2,200 ohms. Now, what that does is it takes our B+, plus, which is it's a little lower after the choke because we had almost a K of resistance. It takes that B+, plus, which is too high. We're looking for approximately 250 volts of clean power. It takes that and it drops it. Now, if we were a little bit lower, let's say, on our household voltage coming in here, then this would be a little lower, and if we were a little higher, we'd have to drop the voltage a little more. This would be a little higher. And then we end up over here on B+. What the heck is B+. Well, B+, is actually battery plus. Way back in the beginnings of the radio days, a lot of people in the rural areas didn't have power and um, didn't get power until after the First World War. And if you wanted to have radio, and you did want to have radio, you had to operate your radios on batteries. So there was an A battery, a B battery, a C battery. So when your, your battery ran down, you just head off to the local hardware store or general store and you just buy whatever battery letter you needed for your radio. And Bob's your uncle. I actually had a, an older friend 
who his very first job on the Canadian prairies was to help electrify the prairies. And he told me that they didn't start until about 1921, and they didn't finish. It took them a decade to wire the prairies up. And he was just a really young lad, but he said it was a lot of hard work, but it was a lot of fun. Okay, what's this resistor over here? It almost looks like it's a short. Well, in a way it is. This is a bleeder resistor. When the circuit is operating, it drains a tiny little bit of energy to ground, and it's wasted as heat. But when the circuit's turned off, you've got a lot of energy stored in these capacitors and other capacitors down circuit, which is dangerous. And what the bleeder does is it very slowly drains off these capacitors to ground. Neat, eh? Now, depending on the size of the bleeder in the circuit, will depend on how fast it happens. I like to get down to a safe voltage of 12 volts. And with a 47k 3 watt, I do that in 60 seconds, and I get to less than or equal to 12 volts. That's my specification. And of course over here we have the B minus. Normally it's not marked as a B minus. It'll be marked as a negative or an earth connection or ground. But I figure if the convention is to mark this B plus, then I'll mark mine as a B minus. Everybody knows that that's your ground connection. In our next video, we're going to take the B plus and B minus, and we're going to connect it up to the preamp pre schematic and see how our clean 250 volts DC works. And before I forget, let's take a look down here at the title box. This is really important. These are very useful. They give you a bunch of information that you need to know. It'll tell you what this schematic or drawing is. It'll tell you who designed it, who drew it, what date, but most importantly, it'll tell you the revision number. So a week ago, we were working off revision zero, and now we're working off revision one. Okay, well, that was fun. Well, uh, let's have a look and see what came in recently. It's been a crazy, crazy busy week with stuff coming in and going out. So these are 4-pin UX, UX4 bases. And they're ceramic. Aren't they pretty? And I believe you can underside, you can mount this on the other underside of your chassis. And if you bend these pens up, I think you could probably and they bend up easily. I think you could probably mount this on the top side as well. Look at that. The gorgeous copper rivets. Isn't that pretty? I love ceramic. It doesn't conduct. It doesn't melt. It doesn't catch fire. It's perfect, especially for bigger tubes. And here's the top mount. It goes on the top of the chassis. Another ceramic one. And you might have noticed that two of the pins are smaller and two are larger. And we'll see why in just a minute. Okay. Yeah. Lovely to take a look at. Now, we were just talking about the early days of radio, and look at this gorgeous thing. Super silver tone. Look at this. Sears Roebuck. Who knew? Sears sold tubes. Well, a long time ago. Of course, Sears didn't make tubes. Made in the USA under RCA patents. So this is an RCA tube. Let's see if we can get this thing out carefully. It's a beautiful box, but it's really old. Oh, look at that, a number 45. Isn't it? Look at the sleeve. Isn't that gorgeous? Let's be careful with this thing. There we go. So... This has got an engraved base. Isn't that lovely? It's a t marked as a 245. Now, before they went to a standard number 245, they just called them 245s. I think it's the same, exact same tube. I think there's actually a 345, same thing. Look at the size of that plate. Now, this is a directly heated triode. Let's look at the top here. 
Isn't that pretty? Okay, what the heck is a directly heated triode? Well, a directly heated triode has a directly heated cathode. Let me see if I got the pins right. So this is pin 2, and that goes to the plate. That's pin 3, that goes to the grid. Pins 1 and 4, they connect to the heater cathode. So when you bring your voltage to here, that turns on the, the filament, and the cathode is one and the same. And you heat up your cathode, and the tube is rocking and rolling. Now, this is directly heated. This is the way early tubes were done. The tubes that we work with today are indirectly heated. So your heater will have separate pins to connect it to, and your cathode will have separate, a separate pin for it as well. Neat, huh? Okay. Well, if you stay to the end, here's some discount codes. And I remember I've got $20 flat rate shipping around the world. And if you spend $150 after your discount, shipping is free. Stay safe, everyone. This is Jim from Valves and More signing off. Cheers, everyone.